and write down stuff what you believe. Yeah. Okay. If there are no further questions, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And for this excellent public discussion, and uh, we can move to the next speaker, Enrico Pensian um, from the German Chemical Research Center in Heidelberg. Um, giving a talk about identification of novel genetic risk factors for PDF by step functional annotation. And I think this will also help to understand how we can use these huge data sets. Thank you. <coughs> so, <coughs> you should move around. So. Yeah, works. All right. So, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, um, very uh, warm congratulations, first of all, to uh, Peter and Miklos for. 10 years of great activity and also for being very active and uh, the collaborators in Pandora and giving a, a substantial uh, contribution to the, to the consortium. Okay, so um, um, I will uh, uh, basically take over from uh, where uh, Daniela left uh, in, in a way. Um, so uh, Daniela showed what we can do with the, with the SNPs that we, we, we know today. Uh, and uh, also obviously highlighted the need to uh, do further study uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm going a little bit in that direction. So, well, first of all, just a very brief summary. Um, when we are with genetic genetic could be dark, you may have seen uh, some versions of this, uh, of this graph where we have uh, a lean frequency versus effect size. And uh, what we know today is uh, a number of low frequency eye penetrance uh, mutations, typically from family studies, and then the typical SNPs that are, on the other hand, high frequency low penetrance and typically uh, identified in GWAS. So today, of course, we're going to, I'm going to talk about uh, this part here. Um, well, um, this takes again a, a little bit of uh, uh, what Daniele showed. Uh, so where we are uh, in terms of uh, eats from cancer GWAS, uh, well, this is the situation for pancreas, and you have to put it in perspective with, uh, uh, in comparison with other uh, cancer sites. So of course, the more common uh, cancers are the ones where the studies are a bit bigger, and, uh, and therefore the, the number of uh, loci that are known are also bigger. For pancreas, uh, as Daniele showed, we are around 30-ish. <clears throat> And where do we go from, uh, from here? Well, uh, where do we expect to go? What, what do we expect to, to find still? Um, um, so this is a table taken from this very interesting study that uh, appeared a couple of years ago, where this is all based on, on theoretical predictions um, <coughs> and calculations. Um, and they extrapolated the total number of susceptibility uh, states that uh, exist in the, in the genome. As you can see, for basically every cancer site, we are in the thousands. Uh, here is the picture of, of pancreas. Um, of course, these estimates have to be taken with a pinch of salt, um, because as you can see, there is a, a very large uh, standard error. But anyway, it's very clear that uh, we are barely scratching the surface, uh, essentially. Um, and uh, well, again, um, Daniela mentioned this, the overall heritability uh, of pancreatic cancer due to common variants in the genome is estimated to be around 20%, uh, 20-25%. And uh, the estimation of uh, what we can explain out of the uh, known loss from, uh, from GWAS is uh, just a fraction of that. So again, it's, uh, this is very clear evidence that there is a lot more to, to be discovered. <clears throat> and so how are we going to do it? Well, um, one of the problems uh, uh, of GWAS um, is that we must use a very strict significant threshold, typically five by 10 to the minus eight. And it's because we are testing literally millions of SNPs, we are doing millions of tests. So obviously uh, we, we need to take that into account. Um, so the, the consequence is that we have very few positives and I think we can believe them, uh, but surely we also have a lot of full negatives. What does it mean that down here, there are probably some real laws that are lurking um, uh, and are waiting to be discovered. So how do we uh, find them? Well, we could um, uh, think of two strategies, very simply and schematically. One is do more GWAS, basically this is what they call brute force approach, um, scan more cases, scan more controls, uh, and then hopefully, uh, with increased power, uh, you will be able to uh, identify a few real loci. And this is very valid, of course, but obviously 
uh, it is expensive and, uh, and uh, complex. Um, <clears throat> a trick uh, is um, um, that we uh, used is to try to mine uh, the JIVAS data once you have them. Uh, and uh, a possible idea, one of many possible approaches, is consider fewer variants and try to uh, consider the ones that have uh, stronger a priori probability of association, for example, by functional annotation. So um, you consider all your SNPs, you try to uh, have uh, a, an annotation that takes into account their predicted function. Uh, and then uh, you remove from the picture the ones uh, that are predicted to have low prior probability, and this uh, means you are considering fewer SNPs. So basically, this means lowering the threshold for significance. It helps to select uh, additional candidates. Then, of course, you always want to um, uh, do additional genotyping, additional kids and controls, but only from for the promising variants, which is a lot less expensive and, and simpler to do. And then hopefully, of course, at the end of the day, you always want to uh, see a very OP value to be uh, sure what you're assessing. So uh, well, this basically uh, uh, summarizes what I just said. So I don't need to spend more time on this. Uh, this is exactly what, uh, uh, what we did. Uh, so the idea is use available GWAS data uh, and use functional annotation uh, to select additional candidates and, and try to replicate the additional kids and controls. Um, so um, this is the overall uh, picture. So we started from an existing uh, GWAS uh, data set, and we will read this a little, in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, we um, ranked all the SNPs in the genome uh, by p-value, and then considered uh, only the more uh, the ones that already uh, seem to have uh, promising p-values. Then we need the function annotation uh, according to various uh, possible classes of the function. Um, sorry, this is written in this small. Anyway, the classes we consider are missense, EQTLs, uh, SNPs uh, possibly affecting long encoding RNA function, uh, SNPs possibly affecting microRNAs, uh, SNPs located in transmission pattern by the sites or in cancers, and SNPs that are predicted to uh, have a role in speculation. We did replication of uh, the best candidates using Pandora and, and a few other populations. And then, of course, at the end, we meta analyzed uh, all the results. <clears throat> so, I'm going to give a, um, um, a few details about the populations. So, our main uh, population um, uh, for uh, discovery was the Pans and Pansy 4 data sets, um, very large sample size. These are publicly available. We simply downloaded them from DBGAP. Uh, and uh, we used up to uh, almost 9,000 cases and 7,000 controls. Uh, most of all, or actually all of them were European ancestry. Um, we uh, used imputation. Uh, this is a very well established uh, methodology. And so the final data set that we had uh, was 7.5 million students. Um, our main uh, replication population was, was Pandora. This is our consortium. Uh, and uh, overall, um, we use almost 4,000 cases and 3,000 3, controls, uh, most of them from, from the European uh, centers <coughs> that collaborate with Pandora. And also, uh, we used, and not in a systematic way, uh, but we also use additional uh, data from, from populations from uh, Pangeneo, which is a smaller uh, European consortium led by Major Malats, and also from publicly available data uh, from an East Asian uh, GWAS that was recently published. Okay, so I'm going to give a couple of examples. Uh, so, first of all, uh, SNPs affecting uh, or predicted to affect a long encoding RNA function. Um, well, obviously, we know that uh, long encoding RNAs are a key mechanism of gene regulation. And there are already some examples of SNPs not being there uh, that have been found associated to uh, risk of pancreatic risk of cancer. In general, not necessarily pancreatic cancer, it's an error. Um, so we, um, we used a couple of publicly available databases, uh, first of all, to locate where the long RNAs are in the genome, the ones that we know of, and additionally, uh, where the SNPs uh, are located in there and what also uh, they are predicted to do. Um, so then it's a scheme that I illustrated before, uh, uh, looking first of all in Pascal Fancy 4, the GWAS data, and then replicating in, in Pandora, and then further use additional bioinformatic tools to try to predict uh, the function of, uh, of, uh, of what we found that we came up with the results. 
So, um, well, long story short, uh, the selection process uh, started from all the SNPs in this database, 10 million SNPs. Most of them are very rare. Um, so with the, with the math filter, we, we did, eliminated the, the vast majority of them. Uh, we didn't go into rare ones because we don't have the, uh, the statistical power for that, uh, even with large studies. Uh, we found most of them in the past conference report data. Um, and uh, we further um, um, selected the ones that in, in this data set uh, had a p value of smaller than 0 0.05. Um, well, actually, this was still a lot, so we decided to put a stricter filter, 10 to the minus fifth, and this is six. We ended up with 67 SNPs. Actually, here we were a little bit on a shoestring budget, so we really uh, wanted a, a smaller number of SNPs to replicate, so we further uh, filter by, by math, and we decided to consider only the ones with manually frequency greater than 5% in the European populations, and these are the ones that we replicated in Pandora. And out of those five, uh, well, one of them really panned out, uh, and you see that we started already pretty strong uh, from 10 to the minus 7 in, in the discovery phase, Pandora uh, showed the modest replication, but still going uh, exactly the same direction with almost exactly the same alteration, obviously the meta-analysis was super significant. Uh, we actually reached or exceeded uh, genome-wide significance level, uh, so we're very happy. Well, uh, this I used, I, I used to have a, an icon with a, with a bottle of champagne that I was screwed up, but anyway, <laughs> we were very happy about this. Um, <clears throat> so we also tried to um, speculate about the, uh, the possible function of this. Uh, I have to highlight this is all based on in silico predictions, so we have no idea whether this is really the, the mechanism. But but we think that it is plausible. Uh, so this SNP has um, the major allele, um, which is predicted bioinformatically um, to uh, bind uh, or to uh, affect the binding of this long encoding RNA uh, to, uh, to this microRNA. This microRNA is known to affect the uh, expression of many genes downstream. One of them uh, is a very interesting gene for, for pancreatic cancer. SDK and to B. Um, so the T allele is predicted um, to uh, favor the, the binding of the monoclonal RNA to the microRNA, and therefore uh, the uh, microRNA would be sequestered and less available to uh, uh, inhibit the expression of CDK and to B. So, in other words, T allele would be predicted to have uh, uh, more CDK and to B around than possibly lower risk to pancreatic cancer according to what we know about uh, about uh, the other lead is predicted to do the other uh, thing uh, so the CLE uh, which is as which we found to be associated with higher risk of pancreatic cancer uh, the bioinformatic prediction is that it would not or uh, with uh, would uh, hinder the binding of the long coding RNA to microRNA and therefore um, the microRNA would be uh, more available to inhibit uh, uh, the expression of CDK and 2B, and this could lead to higher risk of pancreatic cancer. So, once again, this is all speculation or an educated guess, let's say, based on, on bioinformatic analysis. But it makes sense from, from a biological point of view. Uh, so, we are quite happy about this. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, time is, is, is short, so I go uh, much faster about the microRNAs. Um, so here we have a, a complex uh, selection flowchart that I'm not going into the details. Uh, so we consider uh, just the um, SNPs in microRNA seed regions uh, and also SNPs in pre prime UTRs of microRNA target genes. Um, and uh, we use um, Pascal Fantasy 4 and Geneo to make selection, and uh, we ended up with four SNPs to replicate in, in Pandora. Um, and here the, the picture is less uh, rosy. Um, so three of them basically didn't show anything particularly interesting, um, or two of them. Um, so these are the, the numbers that we had. So again, big sample size. Um, and uh, our best candidate is, is here, but you see even after the beta analysis, the, um, the p value is not uh, so strong. So well, we cannot really um, bet on this one. Uh, but this is an example of, uh, of what we get. Okay, um, very quickly, summary of results for the other categories that we considered. Well, the means synonymous and nonsense were a very disappointment. Basically, we didn't find anything interesting. Um, 
EQTS, I'm not uh, um, explaining this, but uh, this was uh, uh, another success story. Again, we, we had a SNP with, uh, so you know, this could be a champagne bottle. <laughs> Another SNP that uh, the three sheet normal significance, uh, the one of coding illustrated. Um, and then uh, these are very recent data. Uh, we still have to uh, do final analysis of this, uh, but uh, uh, SNPs in constitutional factor binary sites on enhancers, we, we have a one that is close to genome wide significance, so not quite a uh, bottle of champagne, maybe a, a glass of beer, but uh, we think that this is also an interesting result. Um, few final remarks. Um, so I think that we can say that this is a promising strategy, a strategy that, that, that works, uh, because we did find some new loss um, with very little cost, I would say. Um, and uh, interestingly, it can be repeated. We are surely going to repeat it when, uh, when larger GUAs uh, will exist. And there is a, a, a much bigger one that is ongoing in collaboration with SCI, and uh, we should have the results pretty soon. Uh, the overall sample size will be much bigger of what is available today. We expect probably around 25,000 cases and similar number of controls of European ancestry and 7,000 cases of Asian ancestry and then again similar number of controls. <clears throat> um, obviously, uh, this is all based on bioinformatic predictions. So, of course, your SNP selection can only be as good as uh, your tools. Uh, so, in some cases, for example, when you look at EQTLs, uh, they we took them from GTEx. GTEx is based on some actual measurements in actual samples. You can't believe that. <laughs> uh, other things are purely in silico, so of course you have to take them with a pinch of salt. Um, and then, as I also highlighted, um, well, the association, the strength of the association, well, you just need to look at the p value. If the p value is small enough, you believe it. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, the mechanism of action, well, then you really have to go into wet lab experiments, and that's uh, really a totally different world, and uh, it requires a hell of a lot of work um, that we are probably going to do for very selected ones, uh, but it's really hard work. Okay, and that was all I had for you, so I just need to uh, acknowledge uh, the people that work on this, so it's uh, essentially work done in collaboration between my group at ECAZ and the Daniel's group in PISA. And then, of course, uh, all the uh, great collaboration uh, from Pandora and also from the other uh, sources that we use. Thank you very much. Thanks for making a great work. A lot of manpower, I guess. So it's also expensive in the end. Unexpectedly, Thank you so much. It's very, very, very nice presentation. As always, I've heard a few of But I used to think that, that this is just, just completely insane, that you know, these odds ratios are so damn low. And then what happened is that Rosendahl published <laughs> a 1.3 odds ratio in pancreatitis research. And then I'm, I sort of mellowed out for lower odds ratio. Yeah, come back in there. I mean, you can't argue with Rosendahl, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but I still question the the investment and the time and effort spent on finding this this very low impact variations. And then one of the good rationales would be really the the wet lab experiment, right? To identify new pathways. But uh, as you pointed out, that it doesn't always happen. It, it, it's very hard work. I mean, if you look at pancreatic cancer, I'm aware of one maybe two good studies um that that really did that extensively um and i mean of course well these are studies that happen that, that were published in nature genetics or nature communication i mean these are really big papers um and, but that tells you also that this means probably having uh, several people working for a couple of years yeah. on, on just one snip <laughs> uh, so it's really hard work uh also because, I mean, I think the situation is here is very different from what we have, for example, in pancreatitis, where you have, is not to say that pancreatitis, pancreatitis is uninteresting, obviously, but clearly you have a much more, how to say, clear cut mechanism, or at least you know very well what are the, the relevant pathways. Uh, and so it's a little bit easier there. Uh, in, in cancer, you could have everything. I mean, the strongest um, risk factor, genetic risk factor that we know for, for pancreatic cancer is uh, a group. 
And what the hell does IBO do in relation to the mechanism of uh, development of pancreatic cancer? It has been published more than 10 years ago, and we still have no idea. Uh, so clearly, it's very difficult. Um, and a few examples that, so that I mentioned of good papers that, that I've seen in the literature. Uh, well, again, uh, you are looking for very subtle uh, effects. Uh, so what they found was, uh, yeah, that uh, the SNP is probably predicted to uh, to um, uh, to have an effect on uh, the binding of some uh, transmission factors. But again, it's not nothing drastic. It's not like uh, black or white. It's just shades of gray. Uh, so again, you really need to have a lot of. Uh, experimental evidence to uh, to do that. Uh, not to say that this is that we should not do it. Absolutely, we should do it. But uh, it's really you, you cannot do it on a large scale. Whereas GWAS, uh, well, it's on an industrial scale. Uh, and there, you really have to every SNP could do something different. So you really have to target your studies to um, to what the SNP is predicted to do. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank you.